Here's the title of my presentation. It's a long title. This is me, my co author is Chen Li Kirsten Rode. This is for the FUG conference. The topic of my presentation is situation where you have to optimize over two or more components. For instance, you have to reckon both with time and with risk. Or in welfare theory, you have to reckon both with several people involved and several commodities involved. Or maybe several producers, several production inputs, well you can imagine there are hundreds of contexts like that and there are thousands of papers that are dealing with it. So we, we have the ambition that the things that we present are relevant to many other people and many other papers. By the way, I will for simplicity only speak about two components, but if it's more than two components, it's very much the same as two components. The big difference between one or two, two or more is all quite the same. So only two components in the presentation today. So, outline of my presentation, in section 1, I will assume only one special case being that you have to optimize over time and risk, which is for instance the typical situation in finance. I will define the classical model there, discounted expected utility, we'll discuss a bit conditions for it, preference axiomatization, but it must be said that this is model is much falsified, maybe even the most falsified model ever. And then the theorem that will characterize it, will be a bit misleading or so or confusing. There will be a paradox showing up there and we have to wonder what is going on. Well, then the rest of the presentation will clarify a bit what is going on. First, in section two, some preparatory definitions. We're going to give general definition, not only time and risk, but any two components. Some concepts will be defined. Then a nice mathematical theorem will be presented that will give some clarification about the paradoxical theorem that we saw before. But that theorem is still, can we call it shocking, still really strong restrictions, surprisingly strong restrictions, and a way it gives some complications. Some things can, are not possible that you would want to, so it's a bit shocking, gives some confusion still. Then, to bring a resolution to that, section three first will be some variations of that shocking result, then some diagnosis to find out what exactly is going on, then some remedies in how we can cure, how we can resolve all these problems, and maybe even put some of them to good use. So it will be happy ending with the remedies coming. Section four will be application, then conclusion, and that will be it. So I'm going to start with defining that uh, uh, classical model for time and risk. I already said it, so I'm going to assume that only time and risk are involved. For instance, a die will be thrown, assume six sides, one of six sides will come up, they have equal probability 1 over 6. That means we're assuming a decision on the risk with known probabilities. But also time is developing that's relevant in this context. Let's assume there are 12 time points, maybe 12 months in a year. If this is, for instance, where you have to choose between uh, jobs with different salary patterns and risks involved, that could be such a decision situation. X11 is the amount of money that you get in the first month, maybe your salary, if side of die 1 comes up. And X112, that same side, but in the last month, month 12, for side 6, we have similar corresponding payoffs. So this matrix describes what is happening. You can say here, for every side of the die, there is an outcome stream coming to you. You can also say every time point you face a lottery. You can say both of these things. For simplicity, every entry in the matrix is going to be a real number, let's say money amount. We have a matrix here. We call such a matrix a risky outcome stream. We do decision theory, that means we have to choose between different uh, of these risky outcome streams. We use a binary preference relation over the outcome streams, uh, risky outcome streams to uh, capture it. And the domain will be r to the power 6 over 12, of course. Here I write an outcome stream without specifying uncertainty or risk. What I have in mind, this is an outcome stream that, that means that you get it uh, for certain with probability 1. It's a degenerate probability distribution. So that corresponds, of course, with the matrix that for whatever side of the die comes up, that is the outcome stream you get. Then you have certainty, uh, probability 1. So in that uh, manner, I, uh, I, it's this is very common in decision making on the risk that outcomes, in our case outcome streams, are identified with degenerate lotteries. And this gives us, of course, a preference relation over the outcome streams uh, corresponding with those matrices. And you can say this is a preference relation of R12 if you want, but I use the same symbol because it's the same, well, it's a restriction of the same uh, preference relation. Similar story for lotteries. Here's a lottery with no time points specified. 
I have in mind you just get that lottery, let's say time point T1, if that is the present, you just get it, and nothing more in the future. It's that lottery, nothing more. That way, by identifying lotteries with matrices in this way and manner, we get preference relation over the lotteries also. Now I define this classical discounted expected utility. Imagine you are facing a matrix. That means for every side i of the die, you face an outcome stream and you evaluate it by a discounted expected utility. This formula, the dj, or the discount weights, you use the utility function. After that, you take the probability weighted average of those things and you get the discounted expected utility. Use the assumption utility continues strictly increasing and all the dj are positive. To avoid misunderstanding, I'm not assuming constant exponential discounting, the general discounting we are going to consider. Now, I already suggested a bit, maybe in all the history of empirical research of mankind, no, no model has ever been falsified more than this one, because everybody reports falsification, and in the behavioral approach, everybody for descriptive purposes, we all want generalizations. For instance, this model is assuming expected utility for risk, but nowadays almost every paper on expected utility and risk starts in the opening sentence by saying that expected utility is violated, that we want deviating models. So this is much violated and criticized. Discounted utility, similar thing, habit formation, uh, sequence effects, uh, separability is very much falsified there, but also much criticized. There's even more wrong with the model than I said so far yet, because if you look at the formula, we see that we are using the same cardinal utility for risk and for time. Many people have criticized that, and already Samuels in 1937, when he introduced this counted utility, he immediately said that the cardinal utility function I'm using here need not be the same as cardinal utility function in other contexts. So people have always been aware of it, that that is a critical uh, assumption, and it has been falsified, criticized a lot. So maybe the most falsified model ever. I'm going to give a preference axiomatization of it. I'm going to start with the standard routine action, continuity, things like that, that uh, nobody criticizes. But of course, this is a very critical model with a very restrictive content, much falsified, a lot of separability going on. So there will also be critical axioms that show the critical content of the model. They come in section 1.3. But first we do the standard conditions. So weak ordering, transitive completeness, Continuity, usually Euclidean uh, continuity. Outcome monotonicity. If you are facing a matrix and in one cell you increase the outcome a bit, you improve the outcome a bit, the cell as a whole, the matrix as a whole becomes strictly better from that. But we have the two components. We can talk about two kinds of monotonicity following now. We also assume lottery monotonicity. That means if you are facing a matrix and one time point you replace the lottery by a better lottery, you improve it there, then the matrix as a whole improves strictly from that. Similar story for lotteries, if, uh, sorry for the outcome streams. If for some side of the die you uh, look at the outcome stream there, you replace it by one that you like more. And remember, we have uh, orderings of the lotteries and the outcome streams, so we can say that if you improve an outcome stream there, then the matrix as a whole becomes better. So these are the kind of routine conditions everybody assumes, not the critical ones. Now I return. I turn to the critical condition that captured this objectionable, because this discount expected utility was very objectionable, the objectionable content. So here now come the critical axioms, and then I could say this is all of them. And maybe you're a bit. There's no technical problem. The screen is meant to be empty because I don't need any more axiom. So maybe it's surprising, but the condition I gave so far are already necessary and sufficient. They imply the discounted expected utility model. Now, at this moment, the rational reaction for you is to feel confused, because how can it be that the m most objectional model that you ever saw is equivalent to the least objectional axioms that you ever saw? It cannot be, you feel confused. And indeed, it's a sort of a paradox. To make the paradox more salient, let me put up the theorem explicitly. So here's the uh, characterization theorem. It says two statements are logically equivalent. So one implies the other, the other implies the one. First statement, discounted expected utility holds. Second statement, those preference conditions that are completely unobjectionable, they hold. These statements are indeed logically equivalent. Now, I may say that it may be in one or two things that I said so far were a little bit exaggerated, maybe. But you know, in mathematics, they take no jokes. The mathematical theorem, I'm not going to deliberately put up an incorrect theorem. This theorem is simply mathematically correct. Those two statements, indeed, those five conditions do imply discounted expected utility. And, and then we already said we were already feeling confused about it. How can it be 
that uh, completely standard axioms uh, imply such a uh, criticized model. That's indeed something that will need more clarification. But uh, I also want to claim, I already said it, that this is the prettiest axiomatization of this counted expected utility that you ever saw. Because all these conditions are very simple, very uh, elementary, and can state them in simple verbal terms. Every non-specialist immediately understands what they mean. So in that sense, it's a pretty theorem, I claim. So then let me say, put up, maybe in Western countries at least, uh, people think that Snow White was the prettiest lady who ever existed. So let me add her to symbolize that aspect of the theorem. I cannot say that this is the most general theorem that ever existed because, for instance, there's, uh, there are several papers, but there's a strong paper by Monger and Pifato, Journal of Economic Theory, 2015. They already give theorems more general than this theorem. This theorem is a corollary of uh, theorems in their paper. So we are not the most general, but I claim we are the prettiest. Because uh, that paper, Monger and Pifato, they seek for mathematical generality. They give very advanced results. Then, of course, it cannot be as pretty. Uh, that pay, her paper cannot really be read by non-experts. So, so that's why I still claim we are the prettiest theorem. That's already one contribution. But of course, there's a paradox uh, pressing on a mind that needs to be resolved. And we work on that, we turn to that. To begin in section two, I will introduce some general definition and concept, but I'm going to do that in the next recording. I'm going to stop this recording here. So we'll be continued in the next recording.